Happening around the country tonight, some getting violent and involving fires after a former Minneapolis police officer was arrested for murder and the death of George Floyd. No justice! No we have to understand and respect each other's background. Absolutely. I've experienced racism. I need you to save me! So even though it's the land enchantment, we do still have some problems. Two thousand twenty has brought challenges unlike anything our country has ever seen as we continue dealing with the pandemic. This year, the state of race relations in America also reached a boiling point, prompting discussions about a divide that's been in this country for years. KOAT has spent the year analyzing respect, race and reform in New Mexico. From the Navajo Nation and our state's Pueblos, where the pandemic has shined a light on historical and current disparities. To how the first all black settlement in our state has left a lasting impact today while disappearing from the map. We're taking a hard look at policing in New Mexico and what it's like to do the job in a racially charged society. We are examining the ways officers are trained to serve the community. And what is it like to be a person of color in New Mexico? KOAT, listen to you and your experiences for those answers. And with that, we are working to understand them with the correct consideration and attention. I'm Doug Fernandez. And I'm Shelley Rabando. This is Project Community, Respect, Race, and Reform. As we head into 2021, it will be a pivotal year for rebuilding race relations from the White House to the Roundhouse. There is a loud demand for reform as states, cities, and police departments are focusing on equality and racial justice. We've even seen rebranding of products that have been on our shelves for years that featured racial stereotypes. Before we look forward at the issues this year has brought up, we have to look back at the high profile cases involving police related deaths. These are what led to protests and discussions about change. Protests, riots, and demand for action. No justice! No peace! From right here in Albuquerque to around the world, the months following May of 2020 were a rallying cry for racial justice and police reform. <laughs> Images of Confederate symbols being removed in the Black Lives Matter movement created emotions in all of us. But these ideas of change have been building for years. In 2014, Eric Garner died in the chokehold of a New York City police officer. That same year, Michael Brown died in a suburb outside of St. Louis, killed by a cop. Over the years, more names added to the list. Breonna Taylor, Alton Sterling, and Philandro Castile, all black people killed at the hands of police. Each case ending with the same result. No murder charges filed against the officers involved. According to MappingPoliceViolence.com, 98% of deaths caused by police from 2013 to 2020 ended with officers not being charged with a crime. This year, when George Floyd died after being held down for more than eight minutes beneath the knee of a Minneapolis police officer, activists said, enough. Black lives matter, and we won't stop until it matters to everybody. Not seen on a scale since the 60s, people around the world examined inequality and the role of policing altogether. It is also reallocating resources, there's no doubt about that, but it's also refocusing what our officers are supposed to be working on. This would be a third branch of our uh, public safety departments. Seven months after Floyd's death, the unrest continues, taking different forms over different issues. The system is not broken. It is working as it was designed, and we must change it. As of today, mapping police violence shows more than 1,000 people have died at the hands of police in the U.S. just this year. A new study shows after the high-profile cases of police violence and a renewed focus on inequality, 48% think this will result in meaningful policy change. And out of that, 46% say it will not change the lives of black people. That's according to the Pew Research Center. Researchers say black Americans believe believe the country hasn't gone far enough when it comes to equal rights. That change came primarily among black adults and among Democrats across racial and ethnic groups. So groups were a majority last year, even before all these events, a majority of those groups already said that the country hadn't made enough progress. And now even more so, they say that. But none of the respondents could agree on a solution. 48% thought diversity training would help, but beyond that, answers were split between redividing school boundaries, reparations to slave descendants, and better hiring practices. From George Floyd to Breonna Taylor, some believe their deaths were part of a bigger problem, what is often referred to as systemic racism. Kayla Norwood takes a look at what that is and how it is impacting lives today. 
A lot of talk about systemic racism this year, some wondering if it really exists and if so, in what ways? Well, I sat down with the vice president of Albuquerque's NAACP to get a clear picture. As an attorney at this nonprofit law center and as the vice president of the NAACP in Albuquerque, fighting for justice is what Pamela Herndon does every day. There is definitely a system of racism that we need to look at and address. She says the issue of systemic racism begins with how this country was formed. So if we look at the Declaration of Independence, it talks about all peoples shall be created equal. But at the same time, we have this huge amount of slavery that was going on where people were not created equally. And if you look at the Constitution, it talked about those who are three fifths of a person, primarily looking at those of African American descent. And she says the issues of racism we see today are a result of the poor practices and policies in place, even in New Mexico, where payday lenders are able to charge interest rates of a thousand percent or more. And who is using that process? It's people of color. We have white people who are living off the backs of people of color, uh, African Americans off of those huge interest rates that they're charging on these interests, on these loans that seem to never get paid off and that they're being paid for the rest of their lives. She also says there's a problem in our schools with black students disproportionately disciplined. According to the U.S. Department of Education, black children represent 18 percent of preschool enrollment, but nearly half of preschoolers getting suspended more than once. So there are policies and it's systemic racism that is being built on both the color of their skin and the race and their culture. And in the death of George Floyd, Herndon believes systemic racism played a role. Overall, she believes communities need to do a better job of making sure there's diversity in leadership. Shelly? The way officers are trained is under the microscope. Brittany Hope tells us what local cadets learn before they put on a uniform and the changes some want to see. I spoke to criminal justice experts and the people responsible for policy changes and learned many believe police reform is more than about just training. It's also about accountability. We teach um, quite a bit about larger issues around race and ethnicity, even gender and inequalities. Um, related to that. Kristen Waldo is a criminal justice professor at Eastern New Mexico University. To be an officer, you have to go through an academy first, and she says that's where her students run into resistance to these ideas taught in her classroom. They're the hope for a new future, right? So it makes me feel very tired. Albuquerque's interim chief says he wants a focus on training. I think that this is an area where we could always improve. Harold Chief Medina explained what that training looks like right now. Could in Academy get four hours of diversity training, 16 hours on community policing, an eight hour course on ethics and morals, and a two hour class on hate crimes. After the events of this summer, did officers have any new courses or any new conversations about this or the way it stands now, does it really all kind of happen in academy and then you're in the field? For the most part, it all happens during the academy. That's something he wants to change, but more on that in a bit. I wanted to hear from local activists. What do they want to see to reform policing? They've done a good job in, in training um, the officers to, um, to follow the policies and procedures, but the problem is um, there's no um, systems or measures in place to hold folks accountable when they do not follow the policies. Baron Jones is the senior policy strategist at the ACLU of New Mexico. He is working with community members and lawmakers to draft bills right now for January's legislative session including a statewide use of force policy for police officers, a New Mexico Civil Rights Act that doesn't allow law enforcement to use qualified immunity as a defense. If a person tries to accuse them of wrongdoing, qualified immunity means officers can't be held personally liable. Plus, creating a database documenting officers who have gotten into trouble. Jones says it's all about building trust. Chief Medina agrees. I'm going to call it the ambassador program. Starting with 10 officers who are assigned to groups based on race, religion, and sexual orientation. That one consistent person for all these different groups to reach out to and bring up their concerns. His goal to meet with those officers monthly. It boils down to this community policing. The only way we're going to build trust is through interaction, consistent interaction, the community knowing we're hearing but also at the same time, the community hearing from us. 
As you're watching this, Chief Medina is working on recruiting the 10 officers for the ambassador program. He says what's learned from the program will be used to update ongoing training for officers. Doug, Shelley. We live in New Mexico, one of the most diverse states in the nation. Action 7 News reporter Stella Sun shows us by looking at the actual demographics of our population. In New Mexico, you see traditions everywhere, from the food to the language to the holiday decorations. New Mexico is a showcase of living history, where you see our various populations show by example, real life experience. Our state is known as one of the only majority minority states in the nation. UNM political science professor Christine Sierra explains what that means. A majority minority state refers to the percentage of a state's population that identifies as something other than only white. Take a look at this chart. According to the latest census, about 37% of our state identifies that they're only white. New Mexico is one of five states that has fewer than 50% of its population fit in that category. California, Nevada, Hawaii, and Texas are also considered majority minority states. The land of enchantment ranks second to California in the percentage of people who identify as a minority, according to the most recent census estimates. Nearly 50% of our population identifies as Hispanic or Latino. The Angle settlement came into the state actually quite delayed compared to other states around the country. White populations didn't really start to advance into New Mexico until after World War II. The rest of our state looks like this. 11% are Native American, about 3% are Black, and another 2% are Asian. Stella Sun, KOAT Action 7 News. Dr. Sierra tells us our majority minority status almost prevented us from becoming a state. Many people in Congress opposing our statehood didn't want a mostly Spanish speaking territory to join the union. Royal. Taking a look at our state's history tells a story about where we are today. Our tribes and pueblos play a critical role. Coming up, how the events of this year brought disparities to light. And Marissa? One of our state's most crucial communities lives just 30 miles outside city limits, but struggles to get things like water and internet. Coming up, I sat down with leaders of the Navajo Nation to talk about how this divide came to be and what they're doing to fix it. You just like sit down and actually like listen and try and see a uh, step in someone else's shoes, you know? instead of just like just being so ton of vision with your ideology. New Mexico's history includes a turbulent and violent relationship between Pueblo Indians and the Spanish. Royal Day takes us through it. Doug and Shelley, it is a troubled past that still haunts many New Mexicans today. It's a summer day in June of this year, Albuquerque's Old Town. Protesters gather around a statue of Spanish conquistador Don Juan de Oñate. They want it gone. Oñate is a controversial figure in New Mexico history. While he's seen as a hero by some for leading the colonization of New Mexico, he's viewed by many Native Americans as a killer who repressed and enslaved their ancestors. Oñate was one of thousands of Spanish conquistadors who arrived in New Mexico in 1598. They came with the proclamations for God, country, and gold. Rachel Moore is the curator of exhibits at the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center in Albuquerque. They're first encounters with Pueblo people was just like, okay, we're here now and this is all ours now, but you can stay here and but you're ours now. She says the Pueblo people didn't understand this way of thinking. Imagine somebody coming into your home and saying, this is all mine now. You can still live here, but you have to pay all of this to me and you have to believe my beliefs and you have to give me all of your resources that you saved for the winter. Moore says there were harsh consequences for those who did not assimilate. They would publicly flog and hang people for disobeying them. The Pueblo Indians pushed back and there was plenty of bloodshed. Moore says in one battle, Oñate's brothers were killed. And for vengeance for that killing is when he sent his soldiers down there to cut off the left foot of every man in Acoma. All of their men had their left foot cut off. The Spanish governor 
of New Mexico at the time ordered several Pueblo holy men executed and many others publicly whipped. Pope was one of the people that was taken to Santa Fe, publicly flogged, and, you know, 12 of his counterparts were hung. In 1680, there was the Pueblo Revolt, a revolution against the Spanish. Historians from the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center say it is the only successful native uprising against the colonizing power in North America. The Pueblo Indians used armed resistance. Pope of Okeowinge organized and led the revolt. He sent runners to all the pueblos with a rope tied in knots. Each day, one of the knots was to be untied. When all the knots were gone, the revolt would begin. The Pueblo revolt broke out August 10th and eventually a siege was laid on Santa Fe and the Spanish gave up and said, okay, we're gonna go. Moore says freedom from the Spanish lasted about 12 years. In 1692, Moore says the Spanish attempted recolonization. It was called La Entrada, which translates roughly to entry. Conquistador Don Diego de Vargas led that movement in which eventually native people ceased hostilities and yielded to European rulers. La Entrada was celebrated in Santa Fe each year during fiestas. Some saw it as a time of joy, but after years of protests from Native American groups, that tradition was stopped in 2018. There was fights and turmoil because the Spanish did still come back in with that heavy hand. The relationship between the Spanish and Pueblo Indians has been a contentious one, and what happened long ago still sparks outrage today. In October of this year, a Santa Fe Plaza centerpiece, sometimes called the Soldiers Monument, was torn down by protesters. It's said to honor the Civil War Union soldiers, part of it dedicated to war heroes who died in battle with Native Americans. Well, Santa Fe leaders say they're now meeting to figure out what to do with the remaining parts of it. Doug Shelley. The historic trauma Native Americans experienced in the U.S. is still existent in society today. Marissa Armas reveals discrimination and disparities on the Navajo Nation. We need roads, we need broadband, we need electricity, we need water lines. The country's first people, but many still living in third world conditions. Navajo Nation has had to deal with actually building that infrastructure from scratch. The Navajo Nation is just one of many tribal communities in the United States dealing with what UNM professor Wendy Grayeyes says is historical trauma. There's actually a whole historical experience um, of the ownership of land. Navajo Nation is just very wide and expansive, so they deal with a lot of rural isolation. So getting infrastructure out is very expensive. So there's definitely a lot of bureaucratic red tape. This historical trauma has led to systemic racism for Navajos and natives alike. And you have this consistency of this culture of poverty perpetuating itself um, generation after generation. Um, then you start to wonder how do you break out of that cycle? How do you transform the reality that's been plaguing our people for so long? For many Navajo tribal members, these disparities make it tough for families to stay on the reservation. I think a lot of Navajos have actually internalized many of these criticisms and it's actually contributed to the out-migration to the Navajo Nation. Like other communities of color, Native Americans have experienced racism and discrimination in the United States. Native Americans were not given the right to vote um, until the 1920s, but even then, you know, there were a lot of literacy tests. You also see that they were considered wards of the state. We lost our lands we got pushed onto reservations. Today, the Navajo Nation Human Rights Commission tracks complaints of racism and discrimination against Navajo citizens, both on and off the reservation. We have to address um, issues in which we're often profiled um, uh, racially, you know, um, as, as part of a minority population within the United States. The commission chair Jennifer Danette Dale says they see the discrimination of their community everywhere, especially in border towns. There is a sustained um, real um, anti-Indianism that exists in these border towns and in urban spaces. Danette Dale says there's a history of hatred. Indian hating really facilitates um, the dispossession of indigenous people, the removal um, of indigenous people from their land, from their land base, and then the continuing ongoing 
um, expropriation of our natural resources. While Navajo leaders say that the COVID-19 pandemic has brought many of the nation's inequalities to the forefront, they say it's crucial that we work to dismantle these systems of injustice. Our obligation and our responsibility to um, see that structure of violence, which is um, Indian hating, um, and begin to try to address that violence. Reporting in Albuquerque, Maris Armas, KOAT Action 7 News. Earlier this year, the Navajo Nation received $714 million in CARES Act funding. The council's already approved millions of those funds for broadband services, water projects, and early education. There's all these divisions. What are we going to do about it? I said, you know, look for the places where there's not and learn from that. She walked alongside history and now watches the same fight unfold today. Her journey at the forefront of the civil rights movement and the lessons we can learn when Project Community, Respect, Race and Reform returns. Things were more divided. Everyone had like trouble understanding it. So I think there's more overall in the U.S. An Albuquerque woman was there during some of the most famous moments of the civil rights movement. Maria Varela is a Latina organizer who spent many years in Alabama and Mississippi capturing images of marches and voting rights demonstrations during the 1960s. Marissa Armas shares Maria's story. Every single photo in fact, she was on the verge of tears when I took that picture is a moment in history. That image making, I think, helped the tide turn in terms of people feeling ashamed or powerless in terms of who they were. And that was for people to reflect back to people how strong and beautiful they were. Through the lens of her camera, Latina organizer Maria Varela captured the black experience during the civil rights movement. We were in service to the local people who are the leaders of the movement. We were not the leaders of the movement. We were not the forefront. In 1963, Varela was invited by the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee to work in Selma, Alabama. While she was brought in to work as a secretary, she was eventually asked to focus on voter literacy and began taking photos to help educate the community. But SNCC photographers were always on call for marches because it was felt that if the state police were gonna start wailing on people with their nightsticks, if there were cameras in their faces, maybe they would just let up a little bit. And we were to document all of that kind of violence. Over the next several years, Varela would document many movements, like the marches from Selma to Montgomery and the March Against Fear in Mississippi. While she encountered leaders like Martin Luther King Jr. and Representative John Lewis, she chose to focus on the everyday people. We were not dependent on having a charismatic leader to get us into the press and before the president Ours was to build the power from the grassroots up. And ultimately, that's what Varela and her colleagues did. A lot of our work in SNCC did get circulated back to through the black community, either through film strips in my case or posters in Danny Lyon's case. Organizing is about building relationships and, of course, the trust that comes with it. In 1967, her relationships led her to organize with the Chicano movement happening in California, New Mexico, and other parts of the Southwest, meeting leaders like Cesar Chavez. Um, they gave me an insight into other kinds of Chicano movement things that were going on, mostly in California and sometimes in Arizona, the work, you know, in terms of organizing farm workers. After decades of civil rights work, Varela says the death of George Floyd sets an all too familiar scene. But what looks different is the way communities are organizing. We were astounded at the amount of interracial, intercultural support that emerged out of the whole George Floyd and all the other murders that happened. But we really need to get people to move from the streets into the communities. And she says that intercultural support, that allyship, is important. To me, allyship means he who has the spotlight needs to help share the light and is reciprocal. For Varela, it's these transformative moments that unify us all towards a greater equality. We have to get out of our bubble and we have to get into the trenches and we need to start working if we really think we can make a difference. Reporting in Albuquerque, Maris Armas, KOAT Action 7 News. Today, Varela works with younger activists in furthering their movement. 
learning how much they were working together to create what their dreams were of a real life um, inspired me. The settlement of Blackdom, now a ghost town in southern New Mexico, but the story and the meaning to its residents' descendants today cannot be overstated. We head there next, Todd. From the past to now, we take a look together at what it means to be black in New Mexico and... There's a diversity of, of terms because there's a diversity of people and experiences. With each ethnicity comes identity. Coming up, why words matter when it comes to describing heritage. In New Mexico, I don't see a racial divide, but we're all one state. If everything just starts to split apart, we're all gonna break down and crash. KOAT has spent the year following the racial divide in America and in our state. Our Project Community Special tonight explores respect, race, and reform and the change happening here to move toward equality. These discussions come after months of protests following May 25th of this year. When 46-year-old George Floyd died in Minneapolis, police departments changed policy. Statues came toppling down and companies pledged their support to black workers and the Black Lives Matter movement. Our partners at The Journal analyzed how everything which unfolded affected New Mexicans' opinions on a variety of these issues. Of note, half the state supports the Black Lives Matter movement, but half the state felt it was not necessary to remove statues. And a majority, 74%, approve of how police do their job. Now we have told you our state has a diverse population, but as anchor Todd Kurtz explains, just 3% of New Mexico is African American. To gain empathy and understanding for others, we're told to walk a mile in their shoes. But as a white man, I truly or deeply will not know the challenges or disadvantages black men have faced and continue to face in our country because I haven't lived it. But we can try to understand and learn and then grow from that knowledge. Here's my conversation. A behind the scenes look at Nexus Brewery. Excuse us. Owner Kenneth Carson teaching us how they make beer. So the grains come down from the mill into the brew house. He credits education and experience in getting him here, a successful business owner. He started Nexus Brewery after a prominent career in the banking industry. And as a young man, Governor Gary Carruthers appointed Carson to be director of financial institutions for New Mexico. I was in effect the director of banking for the state of New Mexico. And at that time, I was probably about 27 years old. A quick start, one that Carson says is not always granted to people who look like him. According to the Brookings Institute, the net worth of a typical white family in America in 2016 was $171,000, 10 times more than that of the average black family. Again, Carson points to better education for marginalized groups as being the great equalizer. Say other people from the community because of the way they talk, or the, maybe even the way they look. There's a prejudice that's there that's underlying that is a negative uh, that goes against the black community. President of the New Mexico NAACP, Dr. Harold Bailey. So even though it's the land in Chamber, we do still have some problems. Unique to black people in New Mexico, it's a smaller group here. They make up just 3% of our population. Nationally, it's 13%. Dr. Bailey says in more predominantly black states, African Americans have more influence on the political and educational systems. I'm not here complaining, I'm just here to, to state the fact. Uh, you can look at some of the boards and commissions, a lot of African Americans are not there. A lot of African Americans are not uh, appointed in high level administrative positions, whether it be a university or government agencies. Both Dr. Bailey and Kenneth Carson were raised in Albuquerque and both say they did experience racism growing up here. I remember my dad being so mad because he knew that that house was not sold. But when we walked up to go take a look at the house with my mom, the people immediately said, sorry, the house sold just the other day. African Americans could only be brakemen carry luggage, help people off, bring them food, but we could not be conductors or brakemen. They were reserved for uh, white individuals. Even with that, both men call their experience in New Mexico overwhelmingly positive. I'm good, I'm good. But say in 2020, it's still not equal for everyone. And it's still evident African Americans have not recovered from slavery, followed by a century of Jim Crow laws that marginalized black people. Anytime uh, black people are asking for something, whether it be Black Lives Matter or, or another particular group, whether Albuquerque and NAACP, we're only asking for equality and justice for everyone and not for one particular group. 
Kenneth Carson from Nexus Brewery in that piece told me 99% of his time and interactions with others in New Mexico has been positive, but there's still room to grow. And in his mind, it all revolves around better education, especially for the impoverished populations. Shelley? The first African American settled in New Mexico more than 100 years ago. Our Kayla Norwood is taking us about 15 miles south of Roswell to the state's first all black settlement called Blackdom. Shelly, I spoke to the descendants of the original settlers and Blackton provided hope during tough times. It was located in southern New Mexico between Roswell and Carlsbad. Though the town is no more, its legacy lives on. It was quite dry and flat and is a large mesa. A very dry and deserted land that many would drive past or look over today. But to several African Americans in the early 1900s, living on this land was a dream come true. And it was something that was a dream in a world where they were, you know, at the risk of being lynched in almost any county. In a time of a segregated South, many black people moved west. Frank Boyer was one of them. He moved from Georgia to New Mexico, founding a new community. He always had this vision uh, of moving back to the Pecos River, which that's where black was located at and 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 settling there. So they call him the Black Moses because he was advertising the whole concept of the prom a new promised land. Everybody heard of, of Black. Mitch Boyer is Frank's great great grandson, and he says just like that, Frank advertised this promised land, and families came flocking. The rag sales and the Olivers. Nikesha Breeze is one of their descendants. Her great grandmother, Jesse Blackball, moved to Blackdom from Texas in 1899 and later married Nathaniel Oliver. In 1903, the town became officially incorporated by 13 African Americans. They in Blackdom had, you know, a whole uh, system where they were able to generate wealth really rapidly, like most of the foundation freedom towns within the United States in that time. They were con containing their wealth, they were doubling it together, they were working together to build each other's homes, you know, to put in a post offices and, you know, they had a baseball team in Blackdom, they had an oil company. Records show the community grew to around 150 people. They established a school inside of a church. The building still stands today, but the good times didn't last long. I think it was definitely difficult to to make uh, to make it work in that dry arid land around 1902 a severe drought made farming and living difficult they couldn't they couldn't survive the drought mm -hmm. so they had to move on Blackdom's post office closed and in the mid 1920s families moved out but its legacy lives on through descendants of the original settlers like Frank Boyer just the recognition uh, of black people. And it was because of him. He opened up a lot of doors. Even today, people will say, are you the Boyer or related to the Boyers from Varro that used to live in Blackham? And the Ragsdales and Olivers, too. And this is two African-American boys facing front. That's the name from the Library of Congress. <laughs> An artist by trade, Bree says the knowledge of her family's past caused her to focus her paintings on recreating the images of African-Americans from the 1800s who remain anonymous. The only thing we have on, let me straighten them out, uh, on them was a little scribble on the back that said Mary and Isadora No. And whose stories are left untold. And she's working to change that by honoring them in this way. Because those like her forefathers who've made a difference in society aren't always well known or remembered. What they were doing and what they were going for, that impetus towards living a life that is, is truly free, that that is still in us and should still stay with us. And we should be reminded of those histories. Having learned much about Blackdom, Breeze hopes to visit the land in person with her children as soon as it is safe to do so. Frank Boyer's dream continued, and after he left Blackdom, he founded Vado, which is still around today. Doug Shelley? Nearly 50% of New Mexicans identify as Hispanic or Latino. While some people prefer the term Hispanic, others might use terms like Chicano, Mexican, or Hispano. So what's the difference between all these terms? Marissa Armas explains why someone might choose one over the other. As a brown woman in this country with Central American roots, I've grown comfortable with identifying as Latina, but not everyone uses that word. We set out to ask a few New Mexicans how they identify. I actually identify as Mexican. I identify myself as Hispanic. I've always identified as Mexican-American. One ethnic group, 
but a myriad of terms. For me, it's important to both recognize my parents' background. Hispanic is more generic. I think we are reframing how we identify. Hispanics and or Latinos are one of the fastest growing ethnic groups in the United States. There's a diversity of, of terms because there's a diversity of people and experiences. Which is why one person might choose to use Hispanic over Latino or Chicano over Mexican. We each come from a different background. Our histories are different. They are linked, however, in the experience of being you know, descendants of, you know, the colonization of the Americas by Spain. Hispanic includes people with ancestry from Spain and Spanish-speaking countries in Latin America. Latino recognizes people with Latin American roots, regardless of language spoken, but excludes Spain. So I think Latino is probably a little more uh, user-friendly, if you will, because people choose that term to say, soy Latino or soy Latina. Chicano is another popular term. University of New Mexico professor Patricia Perea says, it's a word used to describe people of Mexican origin living in the U.S. It's an interesting term because it is a uniquely American term, something that Mexican-American descended people came up with here. While the term Hispanic or Hispano is more widely used here in New Mexico, it's one that some people just don't like. It's actually a term put on by the U.S. government. It no longer matters if you're Argentinian or Mexican or Colombian or Puerto Rican. It's to just put us into this kind of comprehensible, even if it's wrongly comprehensible, box. But New Mexico State University professor Spencer Herrera says some in our region used Hispanic over other terms because of political survival in the 1900s. There are a lot of people on the East Coast, also in southern states, we didn't want New Mexico to become a state because they saw the state as being full of Mexicans and Indians and not speaking English. And so a lot of people in northern New Mexico particularly, they would say, well, hold, hold on, wait a minute. We're European. We're like you. We're Spanish-American. And so they did that to sort of gain equal political grounding, if you will. Historically, people also use the term Hispanic to differentiate from those who recently crossed the border. We have many of the firsts in this country after the indigenous people, uh, but we're often seen as recent immigrants. And I think that a lot of people, you know, shy away from that, from that immigrant experience. Herrera says the denial of our Spanish language and the dismissal of our indigenous past is another reason why the term Hispanic has become so widely used. But we have to recognize that uh, those people would not have survived here without our indigenous brothers and sisters. While terms like Latino or Mexican have become more popular in present day, Perrea says many New Mexicans continue to use Hispanic or Hispano because they have for so long. The terminology to describe the Hispanic and or Latino community is complex, but it's one that Perrea says everyone should learn about and understand. We have, you know, this monolithic Latino thing associated with us. But as a person who's not part of that community, not only do you need to be aware of the backstory or even of the issues that are currently affecting this community, it's like you need to listen to what we're saying. Listen to us. Reporting in Albuquerque, Marissa Armas, KOAT Action 7 News. You may also be hearing the word Latinx. It's a gender neutral term for someone from Latin America or with Latin American descent. So many races impacted in different ways this year. Studies coming out during this pandemic demonstrating disproportionate impact between Black, Hispanic, and Asian Americans and white Americans. Nearly half of the COVID cases in New Mexico are Hispanic or Latino, followed by the American Indian and Alaska Native. But it stretches beyond just cases. When you look at racial disparities in terms of health care, they've been unprepared to really understand the importance of cultural competence. So, you know, is, is there linguistic diversity when you enter an ER and when you're interacting with a doctor? Can somebody even understand if, if English is a second language or if they're monolingual? A Pew study also shows 42% of Americans believe black people are treated less fairly when getting medical treatment, up from 33% last year. The way society has been evolving, there are some, some negative aspects to being law enforcement. And being an officer in a racially charged time, what happens when some officers are being pulled in different directions? We're going to find out about that balance. Plus, we should define who we are, not let folks around the country tell us who we are. A newly formed city office focused on equality, how these leaders are still pushing for change. Next. Just in terms of the way our country is divided, you know, um, 
Systemic racism is a big part in how the government institutions really run this country. Reforming policing in America has been a solution many people have put on the table as a way to move closer to racial equality and justice. KOAT anchor Sasha Leninger sat down with New Mexico officers who say they feel stuck in the middle of a nation divided. I sat down with a handful of officers right here in New Mexico about what it's really like navigating being a police officer and being a person of color in a uniform. It's part of their routine, putting on the equipment and the badge, getting ready for the day ahead. And for some New Mexico officers, the color of their skin underneath that uniform plays a role in how their day plays out. You can't go more than a week or two without getting called a It's tough being a black female in this type of work. Um, it's not impossible. Have you ever felt discriminated against whether you're in uniform or not? Absolutely. We listened as these officers described personal experiences. I went to a residence and I was told because of the color of my skin, uh, I wouldn't be allowed in that residence. and and. By the color of my skin, I meant a racial, it was a racial slur. We don't allow in this house. Out of state, I got stopped and I was being profiled, um, for lack of better words, for, for, ble for being black. Several high profile cases involving police related deaths sparked protests and discussions about race relations between officers and the public. Every time we brief our ERT officers before these protests, I always tell them, you're all going to get emotional at some point in time. And as a police officer, sometimes they're protesting exactly what you're doing. So it can be frustrating for sure. But not all officers agree when it comes to facing racism. From my experience, uh, I don't, I, I've had not had any issues being black and being an officer uh, in New Mexico. For him, it's never been about the color of the officer's skin, rather the character of the person in the uniform. Having a strong will, strong mind, uh, and just keeping your composure. Uh, I think that's, from my experience, uh, what gets me through in situations like that. I recognize I get frustrated and unhappy when I get called these names, uh, but I still have to remain professional. Steps are being taken across the nation to reform public safety, addressing racial, social, and economic inequalities. But we need to keep remembering that people People change, people forget things. You need repetition in order to be good at something. Whatever we can do to, to, to change the light that police officers are under right now, I certainly want to be a part of that. And if I have to take backlash to do it, then I'll do it. Officers on the street know institutional change takes time and changing the public perception could take even longer. Just remember that uh, there are a lot of good officers out there. Uh, one mistake doesn't account for the way that law enforcement is uh, conducted. A Pew Research study found most Americans believe police do an excellent or good job of protecting people from crime, but they gave much lower scores when asked if they thought officers used the right amount of force or treated racial and ethnic groups equally. Doug. We wanted to know if Albuquerque police officers reflect our community. Look at this chart. 43% of cops are Hispanic, while 49% of our state identifies with Latino heritage. Statewide, Native Americans represent 11% of our population, while only 2% of APD officers are Native American. Officers in Albuquerque and city workers are getting racial sensitivity training. It's through a new office that offers not just support for employees, but for the people who live here, too. The Duke City, like so many others this year, has faced a troubled 2020. Some of the challenges even more distinctive here. We have a unique history, uh, more unique than any city outside of, of New Mexico. And so for us, it's not just black and white, right? We have to understand our Native American traditional history, our Hispanic heritage, and everything in between. Albuquerque Mayor Tim Keller says he created the Office of Equality and Inclusion to serve as a resource to help highlight community programs in times of need, from the pandemic to racial justice issues. We saw that play out with uh, these issues around uh, Onyate and others. And so for us, we've got to know who we are. And that's an ongoing discussion. That ongoing discussion happening as the office conducts structural racism trainings for more than 1,000 city employees monthly. And it's sometimes open to the public. People in our country don't get a whole lot of education 
about race and racism from schooling. Michelle Melendez is the director of the office. She says equality and inclusion serves as a link connecting help with need. The office also stepped in earlier this year for asylum seekers passing through Albuquerque. We helped coordinate these numerous community organizations and faith-based organizations so that they could take their volunteers and we had hundreds of volunteers helping to receive. In the end, it was nearly 5,000 asylum seekers who passed through Albuquerque. And now after several months of economic struggles during the pandemic, local businesses can receive up to $10 million of relief grants. But there can be language barriers that can ultimately cost some that much needed money. We translated all of the criteria into okay. various languages so okay. that people who don't speak English can also apply. The office says it hopes to serve as a pathway of understanding and aid during this time of change and uncertainty. It is exhausting. It is, it is terribly exhausting. But this um, the inception of this group and cohort is really important and a breath of fresh air to keep going. George Floyd's impact creating a platform for a handful of students to speak more about racial inequality, a scholarship for these UNM students and why they feel there is so much more to be done. And this from Shelley Leggett. Walking this campus are some of New Mexico's future leaders. Coming up, I'll tell you where they say our state is lacking in racial progress and what the next generation can do to fix it. It's not in your face. It's not skin level. You have to go a little bit deeper to see stuff like that. Race in New Mexico is seen differently by everyone, especially when it comes to our state's younger generation. Shelley Leggett visited with several UNM minority student leaders to see where they feel our state's future is heading. I'm Brianna, Sebastian, Rodolfo, Houston, and Diego. Different backgrounds, different upbringings, and different experiences. But they all want the same thing to bridge the racial divide in New Mexico that they see every day. Like that a lot of the divide comes basically from um, ignorance. They say it comes down to three main categories. Communication. I feel like they don't recognize us as separate and then they make our issues a multicultural issue. Education. So you're not going to get the same experience at like Highland High School as you do at Sandia Prep. And representation. Especially with lawmakers, you know, they have a platform. They've seen small progress, but say more needs to be done. And I think ignorance is, is a key takeaway from uh, people lacking the, the resources or not really caring enough to look into what these issues are. And that starts from the top. It's no secret that this system is, was not made for us. Through state and local governmental leaders. People will actually speaking out on stuff. I think that's mainly what needs to happen as well. The governor and Albuquerque's mayor have taken a stance against bigotry and racism by creating task forces that put a spotlight on the issues that plague communities of color. Like actually like going into the community and like asking people like what we need. And making sure that local spotlight doesn't dim under what the federal government is doing. The federal government will make a mandate or try to pass a law and it's just like, how do we make sure that at a state level and at a local level, we're not affected by this. These UNM student leaders say it's up to them and other young people. It's, it's going to be like a battle between old generation versus uh, new generation. We're learning new tools to advocate. We're learning how to use social media in different ways, uh, petitions, how to push for uh, for policy. So I'm really excited to, to see how else uh, all of us with our different backgrounds um, in our different uh, communities, like uh, you said, Houston, uh, how we can use all of our collective voices and push for, for a, a better world. And speak out for the voiceless, advocating for a brighter future in the land of enchantment. It, it comes into like investing with the youth, investing into the youth, because obviously they're gonna be our future. Our future leaders are gonna have like more experience culturally and more aware. There's definitely going to be challenges. I don't feel like it's going to be easy, like someone said earlier, but I do believe in the strength of everyone to kind of power through it. I'd say that we have a long fight like ahead of us. I know we're going to be okay because we've been okay. 
in Albuquerque, Shelly Leggett, KOAT Action 7 News. One of the things UNM is doing is they created a pilot initiative after George Floyd's death, the Critical Race Scholars. So far, seven graduate students have their research in varying racial issues supported, which all revealed some new information, and we spoke to each of them. This was an opportunity to widen my platform and to really draw attention to the fact that this is happening in the Black community everywhere. Given the voice and the chance to speak up and make your work more public, it's critical because if we don't do it, no one else is going to do it. And it's not just Black and white. It's all of these different issues. It's race, it's gender, it's sexuality. I am incredibly proud to be representing Indigenous people all across the globe as a critical race scholar. This is part of the discussion very complicated nature of trying to solve the very thing that we are also enduring ourselves every day. We have seen a glimpse of New Mexico's future when it comes to respect, race and reform. But for now, we must stay focused on the present. Efforts for change will be ongoing. This year has been one filled with discussions about inequality and understanding how it affects New Mexico and the United States will and cannot stop. We will keep referencing the past and learning from mistakes. And with the past, we will work to understand what equality means each and every day. We'll find the roadblocks still in our way and work together to find solutions. We will adjust the way we look at each other and recognize the internal biases which may still be there. And we'll make sure everyone in our state, no matter who they are, play an equal role in New Mexico's livelihood. Thank you for coming along with us on this Project Community Journey. As we continue to respect each other, understand race, and work toward change and reform. Good night.